So we'll start in a few minutes. But until then, I'll just introduce you and get started. So, hello everyone. Welcome to the SecSoc and CCSoc beginner workshop collaboration. Um, this is mainly a workshop to help you all just kind of get an introduction to security and get a like helping hand with what ETFs are about, as well as some like tips and tricks on like how you can get started and what to look out for and so forth. Um, yeah, so we'll be doing an hour um, talk from Alex, who is here. Alex? Hello. Hello, yes, cool. And then after that, um, we'll go through some of the topics, the like the workshop content. Um, and then after that, uh, we're just going to have like a chill session for whoever wants to stay back and hang out, ask questions, um, solve Jigsaw with us, because why not? It's fun. Um, but yeah, that's more or less about it, uh, unless I've forgotten anything. Um, cool. Do you want to take it away, Alex? Yeah, sure. Let's go. Um, hello, YouTube, and welcome back to my channel. Today, we're streaming my favorite game, Google Slides. I mm, hope we can beat this level. Uh, I've been informed through illicit sources that my mum is watching. So, hi, hi mum. How did you get here? So, I said this talk was about a tour of security, but like, if I'm being real, it's kind of just a bunch of MISC security things, and maybe at the end we'll talk about the jobs you can do, and it's kind of just all over the place. So I'm very sorry. Um, I am watching the chat. I do hear someone asking to see some poggers. That will not be necessary. So my name is Alex, but my handle is at MangoPedia. That's why I have two names in the Discord. Apologies. Uh, but you might notice that on this, uh, on this slide, my name is Alex with the quotes. So you might be wondering what is with the quotes. It's because a while ago I wrote this blog post and a bunch of news websites read about my blog post. They like had articles that was talking about the same thing within the blog post. And they referred to me as a hacker who goes by the name Alex with double quotes like that. And also that's my, that's my real name. So now this is my hacker handle now, and that's just how it is. But if you're worried about, you know, you know, having me having my handle as my real name, don't be. Because if you Google this, this is a while ago, I don't know if it's still true, but if you Google this, you get this guy, Kevin Mitnick. I'm not sure who this guy is. Oh, I see a bunch of people saying about streaming the stream. Uh, Evan, say something if you want me to stop. Otherwise, I will just keep going. Um... Yes, let me... I think keep going, and I will figure it out. <laughs> OK. Um, all right, let's just go with this. Uh, what, what an appropriate slide to stuff on. I wish we'd stuffed on this slide, which is my true bio. So um, this is not really my bio. Don't worry, I have a better one. Um, my job is that I work at Atlassian, the big blue tech company in Sydney. And my job title there is uh, my, my, the thing that I do is called red teaming, which is like a a lot of people use that to mean a lot of things, so I will now explain what it actually is. So basically the job is to commit crimes, by which I mean hack Atlassian just the way that a real hacker would do to try and steal the same things a real hacker would steal, the same data or whatever, do the same techniques they would do, and then show Atlassian how we did that hack, Like because you know a real hacker wouldn't show you how they did it or what you missed, but we show them every single step. And then finally we sell the stolen data on the dark web for big profits. No, we don't, we don't do that last part. That's the difference between us and the real hackers. So I will get to talk more about this in a bit, but that's that's what my job is now. Uh, previously before this, my job was to kind of play the opposite team of this. My job was to like uh, catch hackers who were trying to hack Atlassian and set traps and stuff and make it harder for them to do that. I also, on the side, made this security conference called PurpleCon, and it's like it was a conference you could go to back when we had physical events absolutely rip, but presumably it might happen next year, I don't know. And the reason I made this conference was lots of them. But one reason is that you might have noticed a lot of hacker things look like this. Uh, and like, it's not, that it's not that it's bad that they look like this, but they all look the same, right? They're all very consistent. 
And so we made a hacker conference that looks like this. And it's not, yeah, it's not that the other way is bad. It's just that it's kind of always been the way that hacker culture, like hacker people, are all about rebelling. And it's just that this previous way is this is everybody rebelling in the same way. And I thought it was, we thought it was kind of strange that everyone was rebelling in the same way. So we made a second way, but we're not saying there's just two ways. We're trying to like, I hope this inspires people to see that they can rebel in their own way. It doesn't have to be the same as everybody else. Uh, also, on the side, for real though, uh, here's a tweet I made yesterday or a while ago, being like, oops, I mixed up my pictures of cybersecurity products and men's deodorant again. I, I look at this image, which ones are cybersecurity products? Which ones are men's deodorants? Like, it took me, it takes me a second to pause it every time, but hmm, don't they look similar? Just something to consider. Okay, so, but enough about me though. What is hacking? There's a lot of confusing information out there, like this picture I found on Google Images. I don't know what it means, but maybe maybe somebody might try and tell you this is serious. So to show you what hacking is, I prepared a short video. Uh, I hope this plays. Yeah, okay, let's go. These are actual crimes. Yes, I hope that made it more clear. Okay, good. You could hear the sound. So, uh, you know, that was just a video. Don't try this at home. I did get arrested immediately after doing that. So that was a while ago, though. I just wanted to... To do an introduction to security, I thought what security things have happened to me lately, and I just wanted to share those with you. So last week, my friend sent me this message in a group chat saying, hey, I stumbled on the web page for the EDM lost for something. I don't know what EDM is. It's not electronic dance music. That's all I know. And, it's, and my friend says, but it literally has so much info on a bunch of people. And I was like, wow, what, what is this? And so I went to this like page that my friend linked me, and I was like, oh, Oh no, it's got the uh, email address and where they live and uh, what their physical address and their postcode and what kind of phone they have and their phone number and whether they have a cat or a dog or and their uh, and like so much information about people. And this is all from a uh, like this this data is all from people who have subscribed to some weight loss company. And I, this this is just some text files just on the internet. And I looked at it; it has about forty thousand lines in it. And my friend just just sent me, hey, look at this data that's just it's just on the internet. It's just there. You can look at it. You don't have to log in. It's just there. And I was like, oh, damn. Uh, and when I looked at the URL for this, it was something.com slash images slash something, something, something.txt. And you know when you see that, you're like, well, that it's slash images. That looks like a folder. Like, surely they wouldn't just let you. What if I deleted everything after the images and just went to slash images? Surely they wouldn't let you do that. And yep, they did. There's a whole bunch of stuff on whatever this website is. I like vaguely looked around. It seems to be some like company in the Philippines that like I saw somebody's like you know somebody had their like report spreadsheet and they had in their they had their like uh, the file location was like C colon users colon somebody's name and then uh, the company I looked up and it's in the Philippines. I don't know what this place does but they have all this data from 2016 just here on the internet, and it's uh, really bad. Um, I, I, maybe I should try and contact them and tell them, please, no, not like this. But, you know, this is pretty public, so I'm sure I'm not the first person to find this. And I asked my friend, who like, who, like, doesn't do computers for a job or anything, I asked them, like, hey, how did you find this? And they said, oh, I was just trying to look up, like, a person, a client of ours, like a, a human, and Googled her full name and suburb, and this was literally the only result. So my friend found this on Google accidentally. But really, finding stuff on Google on purpose like this is something that hackers try and do all the time. Uh, no example, just trust me. And you might be thinking, OK, but that's just one website. Like, maybe that's just like one, pe one like people that messed up or like made this mistake of publishing this thing. Maybe it doesn't happen all the time. And you're, not, you're right, it doesn't happen like literally all the time. But here's a famous Twitter account called Need a Debit Card, which retweets pictures of other people tweeting both sides of their credit card. This is a pretty old picture, but this is like a, 
uh, this is, there's so much of this on the internet that there's a Twitter account dedicated to just on Twitter, just people posting both sides of their credit cards. And it's like, it's not like, oh, these people are so dumb. Like, let's not race these people. Like, they don't know. No one tells them. Like, like it's they're just like not thinking about it, right? No one like makes it. No one says, hey, do not post this on the internet. So like, like we're not here to race these people. But I'm here to say, oh boy, this kind of stuff happens all the time. Uh, also, because this is old, just yesterday, I went on Instagram and searched for hashtag boarding pass. And uh, I was like, I wonder if anyone's posted there. Yep, lots of people posted their boarding pass. Here's some person from Russia who has. That's cool. And uh, if, uh, if someone posts their boarding pass, often you can scan that barcode that I've blurred out. And then that lets you like uh, log into the airline as them. And you uh, this whole boarding pass hacking thing where you get people's passport numbers or you get their whatever details, depending on the airline. Uh, and so, yeah, hackers love to search. Like hackers love to search hashtag boarding pass and see people posting their identities, and like no shame, like no shame on this person because like it's not obvious that you're not meant to post your boarding pass, right? Um, but maybe that's just maybe that doesn't happen all that often. Well, it kind of happens quite frequently. There's a lot of a lot of posts on this uh, hashtag, and I'm sure there are other hashtags which have way more boarding passes. This is just the most obvious one. So, okay, this is kind of what's been happening with me in security in the last week. Um, but that was last week. What about this week? Can anyone, anyone think of what's been happening this week in security? That's one thing that I've been thinking of, one thing people have been telling me about. Yeah, that's right. I see someone posting Twitter. That's right. It's the Bird app. They're at it again. Something has happened. That's right. Double your Bitcoins. So uh, for everyone else, uh, here is a tweet from this guy, whoever this is. I'm not sure who that's supposed to be who says, I've decided to give back to my community. All Bitcoin sent to my address below will be sent back doubled. I'm only doing a maximum of $50 million. OK. And there's a Bitcoin address. Enjoy. Uh, wow, how generous. And when people saw this, uh, everyone was like, what? what? Well, some people were like, hell yeah, Bitcoin doubling time. But most people were like, whoa, this person's been hacked. But then a lot of people started tweeting this. Then like the president of America started tweeting the same thing, the exact same text, or I think very similar text. And then lots and lots of other famous Twitter accounts started tweeting that they wanted to, uh, that they were feeling generous and they wanted to double people's uh, money with Bitcoin. And so eventually they realized, well, eventually people, we realized that it was not that these individual people had been hacked, it's that Twitter itself had been hacked. And so someone had the ability to log into any Twitter account. Uh, and this is still kind of being investigated right now, so no one knows the full story. And more and more is getting published. Like, I haven't checked today. I'm sure more things have come out today. And so, but uh, here's, some, here's some parts of the story. Uh, this is a screenshot of some hacker forum uh, saying that, like, uh, hey, what's up? I'm pulling email for any Twitter slash taking requests. So it says, uh, for $250, you heard me, $250 per email to any Twitter account. So what they're saying is, uh, I will, I think they're saying, I will change the email address that belongs to any Twitter account to whatever email address you tell me to for $250. And so why is that good? Because if I can change... Uh, the president of America's Twitter email address to alex at gmail.com. And also if that was my also if that was my email address, it's not. Then I could go to Twitter and reset my password and they would send the password reset email to me. There's also some shenanigans going on with two factor auth and stuff, so I'm not sure exactly what the details are. But like this is enough to take over the account for these people. And so wow. And so a bunch of people did this for a bunch of famous people and got a whole bunch of Bitcoin money out of it. And but you might be wondering, how did they do this? How are they able to change the email address? And uh, no one knows exactly, but uh, the no one knows exactly how they got to this part. But one thing they did was they logged into Twitter's admin tools. So this is like a special website that this person is posting screenshots of on Twitter, which is a very big brain. Uh, this is a special website that only Twitter employees have access to, uh, well, are supposed to have access to, and they use it for support. So you, Basically, if you're logged into this website, you're sort of in control of every Twitter account. You can change anyone's handle, you can make anyone tweet, you can reset their password, you can do anything. Because that's what the support people need to do their job sometimes, right? Like somebody says, I forgot my email address and my password and my phone number or something, and they need help to get back into their account. And so this is how Twitter does that. But the problem is that this is very, very, this is like a lot of access. If you're a Twitter support person, you have a lot of control. You can do stuff to any Twitter account. And so somehow, uh, I think, the people are speculating saying it was through some hacker somehow got into Twitter's internal Slack. And so Slack is like, this is like Discord, except it's not for gamers or something. I'm not sure. The companies don't use Discord, they only use Slack. And uh, they got into that and they somehow found whatever access, like whatever passwords or URLs or something that they needed to get into this Twitter admin panel thing from Slack. And then off they went. 
And they did this to a couple, a whole bunch of Twitter accounts before they got eventually banned and kicked out. And they made about $100,000. And a lot of people are saying, come on, you could have done something much cooler than that. But oh well. Um, I also wanted to show you, kind of unrelated, this incident response bingo card that I helped uh, somebody make years ago. So this is a, you know, you, have you ever seen like when a company gets hacked, they post this like blog post saying, oops, we got hacked, we're sorry, here's the deal. This is a bingo card you can play whenever you see somebody uh, post a message. So they say kinds of things like, oh, well, security is very important to us. Oh, we're sorry about your, uh, you know, we've lost your trust. As a precaution, we've reset all the passwords, blah, 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 blah. They say this is a very sophisticated attack. The people who hacked us were very smart, definitely not uh, random 17 year olds. Uh, and, you know, they also love to say, we take security seriously. So this is a bingo card you can use. It's pretty easy to get bingo. It's kind of harder to not get bingo. Someone run this against the UNSW security emails. Uh-oh, I didn't know they had those. Anyway, moving on. Uh, abrupt topic change time. Let's hack some exams. That's a bit, in much effect, that's a bit clickbait, but whatever, this is what the topic is about. Um, this is a story from a few years ago. Uh, this is not this exact website, but I'm using it as an example. I was, uh, so we're not here to race UCID, I went to UCID, that's why this is here. Um, but I was studying for a math exam and the bunch of, and the math, uh, like the math course page posted a bunch of past exams online. They say, hey, what's up? Here's a bunch of past exams you can use to study. They got, they got questions, they got answers. And I was like, great, it's a good way to study math. And, but the past exams went back to, they only went back so far. So let's say they went back to 2011 and, you know, I was doing them all. But the, when I clicked on this, like, uh, you know, 2015 exam, the URL, if you look in the top right, is, you know, something, something, something slash exam 15 dot PDF, like 15 is in 2015. And I was like, okay, and the, the 2014 one is exam 14, 13, 2013, 2013, and so on and so on and so on. And so then I was like, hmm, uh, I really love these past papers. Sure would love to do more math for fun. I wonder what would happen if I just changed the URL to be 10 instead of 11. Would I see another exam? And we'll never know, because that's where the story ends. Uh, but if one had seen an exam in, uh, that was not like linked on the web page, but was actually still available by URL, then that would be bad, because maybe the people who are running the course would use reuse questions from that same exam in the exam this year, because they think the students haven't seen it. Anyway, too late, you see it. I already graduated. You can't expel me now. Moving on abruptly again, there's this, this is the name of a vulnerability. Uh, it's MS, the code name is like MS1710, I think, I know that from memory, it's called Eternal Blue. Has anyone heard of this? I'm imagining people are going to type in the chat. Yeah, they are, nice. Okay, it sounds like, oh, I thought some people have heard of it. Someone typed in the chat, no. Respectable, absolutely respectable. Okay, so this was, uh, here's like a high level explanation of what this is. This is probably like the most devastating like security bug or security vulnerability to come out in a while. Um, so it's a bug in Windows, so you know, like Microsoft Windows, uh, and it lets you get remote control of any Windows computer. Good slide making me. All right, nice. Let's you get remote control of any Microsoft Windows computer. Okay, good. And by remote control, what I really mean is remote code execution. It lets you execute whatever code you want on that computer. And it executes that code as root or as system, as it's called in Windows, or as admin. So it lets you do whatever you want on any computer you can talk to. And the Worst part is that once you've got control of that computer, uh, say like, you know, you hack some computer in somebody's office, that computer then has access to more computers than you do, right? Because it's inside the office, it can see the other office computers. So you can then get that computer to start hacking those computers. And this spreads and spreads and spreads kind of like a worm uh, because this is just a really, wow, sure, like, sure lets you get into any computer, that's, any Windows computer, that's pretty good. And so this bug was used by the NSA for well, the, the NSA found this and used it in secret for a while. And then there was this whole thing with where the NSA got hacked and someone published all of their like hacking tools and secrets publicly. So then suddenly everybody was, everyone had all the NSA's cool toys and everyone started hacking stuff with this bug. And if you're thinking, wow, really? They say it's some, really the ability to hack any computer was like, or any computer that hadn't been updated was made public? Wouldn't a lot of computers get hacked if we did that? The answer is yes, they absolutely would. Did you ever hear about WannaCry? Or that's another one called NotPetya, I think, which was the names of kind of the first big uh, ransomwares that kind of hit a bunch of people. The method that these ransomwares used to get into computers and start ransomwareing them was this bug, was this, was this eternal blue thing. And quick explanation of ransomware, 
uh, if you haven't seen it, ransomware is software that uh, someone gets into your computer and gets the ability to execute code on your computer, and they then encrypt all the files on your computer and then delete the original copy and replace the file with the encrypted version. And then they say, they pop up a big scary box that says, send me $300 in Bitcoin if you ever want to see your files again. And if, and if you send me the Bitcoin, I'll send you the decryption key. Then you can decrypt your files. But if you don't, then your files are deleted forever. And then uh, even if you do send them the money, which you should not, they don't decrypt them because they can't, or their thing goes down, or like there's no guarantee they'll actually do it. So you should never actually pay the ransom. That was my, that was a PSA. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, the conclusion that I've come up with for from all these examples is that everyone thinks that their security is like this big boy castle, but really it's more like this. And I use this image, like I think of this image so much because it describes so many situations. It describes so. Uh, much security. Uh, it would take a truly obliging attacker to struggle with opening the gate or climbing over it. Most people would simply calmly walk around the gate. So, you know, I hope this image inspires you in times of hacking. Okay, now it's time for a fun exercise because this is like, you don't have to just listen to me talk about things the whole time. Let's do this exercise that I really like it, so I hope you like it too. Uh, and it's a, it's a mystery because after we do it, I'll explain why we did this. Okay, so here are the rules TM. Let's answer some fun interview questions. What are they interviews for? Where did I get the questions? So many questions. We'll, let's talk about it after. So you're going to be given two scenarios, and each scenario has four questions. And they'll ask you, uh, all the questions are, list 10 ways to something. And so your, ten, your answers, your 10 ways, and I'm going to ask you to do this in the chat. Your answers should be brief and to the point, so they should be like basically as short as you can make them while still describing what you want. And if you want to describe, uh, if you want to list a task that you're going to do, you sort of have to describe the method to do it. So for example, you can't say, if it was like list 10 ways to open a door, you couldn't say, I open the door really, I, you couldn't just say, I open the door, or like, I use a sponge to open the door. You got to explain how you use a sponge to open the door. That's a bad example. I just made it up. Uh, and also, yeah, you don't want to skip ahead. So like, do all 10 answers before you do the next one. I mean, I'll wait, I'll wait until we've done I'll wait until we go to the next one anyway. And it says untrue answers are not valid. Uh, I didn't write this, but that's a bit of a flex. I think what it just means is like your answers have to be like realistic. They have to be the kind of thing that you can actually do in the context. And keep answers to single sentences, make them short. That's the deal. So, okay, here's the first scenario. Uh, in this scenario, you are an electrician. In front of you is a light hanging from the ceiling. And behind you is a light switch on the wall. The light is currently on. So this is all the information you have, and all the inf and you can you can and probably should use this information to answer your questions, but you don't have to. The first question is list ten ways to turn off the light. And so I'm going to ask people to do this in the chat, but don't just post your ideas one at a time because then you won't do ten. Someone else would do ten. So I'm going to stop talking for a while and give you a second to go do this. But when you've got them, post all ten ways at once in the chat. So I'm going to I don't know. I'll pause for some minutes. But let's say. We'll start with three minutes and people can post some and then we'll do more. So I'm setting a three minute timer now. Enjoy.
Okay, so that was, it's been two minutes, there's one minute left. I'm going to say nobody post any of your answers, even if you have all 10, until it's been three minutes. And if, if, you do see, if you do see answers, try not to look, like if you're still writing, try not to look in the chat and accidentally get spoilers. But yeah, it's hard, huh? Okay, it's been three minutes, so you may start posting all 10 of your answers in the chat, if you like, unless I'm talking about them, but we're going to give everyone the full 10 minutes for this first question. Okay, so everyone who didn't post 10 things has not done the thing, so go back and uh, go back and edit your message with all 10, because you have to get to... Like the tenth one is the tenth one, the ninth and tenth ones are the important ones. So uh, go back and edit your message or change it, whatever, until it has ten. It's fine. We got uh, six more minutes. But yeah, if you have one, that, if you have a message that doesn't have ten, go back and edit it. I assume you can edit it until it does. So there's about three and a half minutes left until it's been the full 10 minutes. Um, soon I'm going to start talking about the answers people have put in the chat.
Okay, so there's three minutes left, but I'm going to stop the timer and start talking about the answers that are already here, and then we'll move on to the next one. And at the end, we'll talk about what this is and why we're doing it. So um, feel free to read the chat as well if you've already done yours or if you're not doing it. Um, you notice that a lot of the uh, a lot of the first people's a lot of the first answers people have are like the obvious ones, right? Which is good, right? So people say flick the switch, right? Uh, turn off the light bulb, and then they think, okay, can't turn it off, break the light bulb somehow. And people are getting more creative, saying stuff like, uh, un like unscrew the bulb, or don't break the whole light bulb, just break the filament, or cut the wires in the wall. But then, as you go later and later in people's lists, people kind of get more creative, right? So people start saying, ask someone else to do it for you. Or some people say, yeah, you're the you're an electrician, so you can call the electricity company and tell them to turn off the light, the whole power to this house. Or people say stuff like, uh, cut the power lines connecting the house to the grid, right? Or cut the power lines connecting the uh, house to the light bulb, and so there's a, like there's a couple of good themes here, like uh, you know attacking the electricity company, getting them to turn off the power, attacking the actual wires, attacking the light bulb itself, and these are all valid. Uh, some of the less valid answers, well, like not here to roast, but some of the ones that will not work in the future ones are like uh, so stuff like turn off mains electricity to the house. That's good. Destroy the power supply company. We didn't really say how you're going to destroy the power supply company, so I don't know if that counts. Maybe if you can describe how you would do it, that's fine. Uh, destroy the world. Again, if you can describe how you would do it, if you can describe how you would do it, probably don't, because someone might do it. So I'm not going to count that one. Uh, and those people are also saying other things like uh, stop paying the bills. That's a clever one. Like that's good. Uh, just wait, wait for the light bulb to die, which it will eventually. These are also good. Like generally, looking the later answers people have are uh, like more likely to be like sort of creative or like oh I didn't think of that. And people are saying stuff like yeah, cover your eyes. Does that count as turning off the light? I didn't really say. I guess no, because the light doesn't turn off. But if your goal is just to not be blinded, maybe all you need to do is cover your eyes, right? That's That sounds like creativity to me. Okay, so without much explanation, uh, I'm going to move on to the next one. And then once we've done all of them, we'll talk about it a bit more. Then we'll do the next question. I'm also going to give you much less time for the future ones, just so we can see see them all. So same thing, post all 10 answers in the chat once you have them. Here is the next part of the question. Same scenario, but it is list 10 components of a functioning light. There's no more detail than that. You just got to go with the question as it is. I see everyone's getting wrecked by shift enter. It's hard. It is hard to not. It is hard to do shift enter every time. Fair.
Oaks? Yeah. With this light, are we assuming anything about it? Uh, the, every, all the information in the question is on the screen. So you can like you can make some assumptions, like you you can if you can make an assumption, but you have to justify it using the information that's there. Does that make sense? Yeah, cool. Oh, yeah, I haven't said. Uh, yes, feel free to post your answers if you have them by now. More people doing that, um, unless you are an electrician or you happen to have studied this a lot, you will notice that you, you don't know that much about the components of a functioning light. That's okay, that's the point. You don't, you don't need to be an electrician to answer the question. Okay, I'm going to start talking about the answers now because there's a few here. Um, so um, let's see, someone started with the universe. No, the universe is not part of the light. Um, I guess you could argue that the light needs to be in the universe to exist, but I don't think it will help with the question. Um, oh, I do really like this person has listed the light bulb company as a component of a functioning light. That's that's clever. Like it's not literally in the light, but like that's kind of how the light got there. That's really good. Uh, let's see what else is here. People saying, yep, the, yeah, I've also not specified there are many kinds of lights, right? There's like LEDs, there's not LEDs, there's, I don't really know that much about the lights, there's a kind with gas in them. And so I know people, some people, some people know about different types of lights and are going into what those are, and that's good. But the interesting part is like kind of the last, the last kind of, the last half of people's answers. I like this person who's got transistors, four question marks, diodes, four question marks. I don't actually know if these things are in a light. Uh, I like this answer that someone says, the person turning it off and on, that's legit. I'm into it. Um, okay, I don't know if it's actually going to help, but uh, big comedy value for the person whose 10th answer is darkness. If everyone is rich, is anyone actually rich? I'm into it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Um, no comments on this one, I think. I think I've said enough. But, uh, well, no, yeah, I'll comment on, comment on it at the end. Uh, I'm going to feel free to feel free to keep answering this one, but I'm going to put the next one up on the screen. So the next the next part, is there's four parts to this electrician, electrician one. And the next one is list 10 ways to tell if the light is off. Same rules as before, post all 10 in the chat when you've got them.
All right, so if you have answers for that, feel free to start posting them now, but also feel free to keep working on it. Yeah, okay, this is good. I like what I'm seeing so far. So people are saying, uh, you can tell you can tell if the light's off by checking, is the bulb broken or damaged? Is the filament burned out? Does the switch not cause the light to turn on? Kind of. Um, and there's another one that says, uh, when you realize you can turn it on, that's kind of big brain, right? If, if it can be turned on, then it's off. I like it. Um, people are saying, yep, touch the bulb and see if it's hot. Phone a friend. Ask a friend if the light's on. Yeah, yeah, I'll pay that. Release some moths and see if they fly to it. <laughs> no, but it's good. Get a cat and point its face at the light bulb, see if its pupils dilate. That's good, that's creative. I mean, you don't have a cat, but like, sure, maybe there's a cat around in the house. I'll pay that. Call the programmer and see if they start screaming at you to turn on dark mode. Got them. Yeah, this is cool. Someone's saying use an ammeter to check if a current is going to check if current is going to the light bulb. Yeah, I remember doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, so you'll notice that like people's like the reason the questions are in this order, right? The answers. Well, no, actually, I shouldn't say that until the very end. No, no, no comment. Um, are we ready for the next one? I, for the interest, in the interest of time, I'm going to put the next one up there. So this is the final part of this question. Like, this is the final part of this electrician question. It's my favorite part. Um, there's been some real good top 10 lists going on, so get ready for the best one. The last part is list 10 ways to prevent somebody from being able to turn off the light. And I'm going to give everyone a bit more time for this one because I think it's good. So I'm setting a, let's say, five minute timer.
So it's been three minutes, one in that you have two more minutes left for this question until you can post things. Okay, it's almost been five minutes, so I'm going to say you can post your answers now if you have them, and I'm also going to start talking about them, but feel free to keep posting them while I'm talking about it. Whoa, okay, there's a lot of answers. I'm going to scroll up and start from the top. Uh, okay, so the first thing I'm noticing is a lot, it's interesting. Some people are interpreting this as there is one person who you need to stop from being able to turn off the lights. So they're talking about, you know, tie up the person's hands or something. And other people are interpreting this question the same way I interpret it, which is how to stop, you know, anyone from being able to turn off the light. But I don't know, like, I don't. I assume that is the intended interpretation, but I think both are valid. So, okay, what answer do we have? Uh, so, um, guard the room? Yeah, but how do you guard the room? Um, what else is here? Tell the person not to and hope they agree? Yeah, okay, that's that's a lot of security in the real world works like that. You ask them, you know, you tell them, no hacking allowed, don't do it. Uh, make the switch really tall? Yes, I'm into it. Turn it off yourself so they can't turn it off. Huge galaxy brain. Uh, and it, look, it's true. That matches the question description. Or maybe, you know, maybe you want the light on. Hmm. Don't include a switch to turn it off. Yep, I like it. That's good. That's creative. I'm into it. Uh, set up traps for when they mess with components of the light. That's interesting, but I would like to hear more detail about what the exact traps are. But I think that's, like, in general, a good strat. Yeah, I like uh, this. I like this person's answer. Hide the switch. Yep, that's legit. Um, and, you know, unless they find the switch. This person says hard code the electricity, so there is no way to turn it off. I kind of get we. I kind of get where you're coming from with this, but yeah, it's like don't have an off switch. Mm -hmm. I guess there is an off switch. I guess they've said. I guess the question does assume there is an off switch, but it's fine. I, I'm going to take that. Tell them the light is off to begin with. Huge brain. Convince them that it simply is already off. I mean, I'm sure that works sometimes. <laughs> Unscrew the light bulb, run away with it, and power it with a portable lemon battery. See how creative you're being? See how this is great. I want to join Lemon Gang. I want to be in the Lemon Light Bulb Gang. Install the light bulb and the switch 30 feet in the air, metric uh, imperial units, but okay, and buy all ladders in the local area so they can't buy any. See what I'm talking about? See how the later answers are so creative and so good? <laughs> and this person's answers are all about how to, like, make someone like control somebody and not make them want to turn off the lights like appeal to authority say i'm an electrician so i know it's best uh hint of the consequences of the light being off outright threaten them or number 10 the most drastic solution murder i think like, i didn't say so but i i personally am putting murder out of scope for this question 
but okay, there's lots of questions. Someone says, is this a security workshop thing? I'm confused. Completely fair call. No, you've actually come to uh, an electrician workshop. Uh, but don't worry, it's not really an electrician workshop. This is just a front. Uh, thanks for posting all the answers in the chat. Everybody, this is really going to help me with my electrician interviews. OK, so let's talk about this. There's another one of these, but let's do it later, not right now. So let's skip that and go to why. Let's pretend you didn't see this. And let's go to why did we do that? What is the point of these questions? Why am I asking you about light bulbs? This is not about light bulbs. It's not about electricians. That was just the first example. There's actually 10 total. What is the point of all these? I really like these because they are not like hacking a computer or defending a computer or not actually doing security, but they make you think about the same things you need to do when doing that. So in fact, let me actually just awkwardly go back to the questions so we can see what they all are again. Um, so the questions in uh, the questions are in this order, and I really like that they're in this order. For example, you have to learn about the 10 components of the functioning light, or you have to think of the 10 components of the functioning light. Uh, and like the whole point is you don't know all the components of a functioning light, right? So it tests like, oh, how well can you reason about what the components must be of something you don't actually understand all the details of? Um, you could, of course, like, you know, research how lights work and Google it, and that would be fine too. But it's uh, good being able to do it not like that as well. And ways to tell if the light is off, this is, this is a lot like, well, there are some parts that are related to like the detection part of security, right? This is like ways to tell if you've been hacked or ways to tell if the thing is working the way it's supposed to work or something. And everyone's ideas are really, really clever, right? Like everyone, like once you got to like the bottom of the list, people's like seven, eight, nine, ten answers, like go back in the chat and read some other people's answers. They're like really creative and really clever. I think I think one that I didn't see in the chat, but one of my favorite answers to this was uh, in the way that to prevent someone from being able to turn off the light, some uh, someone's answer was, cover all the walls and ceiling and floor of the light switch room with identical light switches, and only one of them is the light switch that actually turns the light off. And I was like, hell yeah, that's so, that's so great. Like, okay, it's a bit impractical, but like, that's, that's such a creative way of doing it. And so the point of this is to test like uh, a few things. Well, to test, measure, to kind of just practice a few things. It's your like creative thinking skills, because it's deliberately asking you for 10 ways to do something really simple, like turn off a light. And the whole point is that you exhaust the like obvious ways pretty quickly. And to get to 10 ways, you have to start thinking really creatively, which sort of makes you do that. And you ordered really well. And the other thing is to test or test, measure, practice, whatever, how well you can sort of explain your idea, or how well you can communicate your idea to the person reading it or to the person you're talking to about it. Because like if they don't understand your idea, it doesn't count, right? And uh, that we also, the question also makes you answer in really short sentences, which makes that sort of, makes you have to concentrate on it or makes it harder. And so these questions come from um, the open source security something something manual, which I'll link at the end of this. And they're kind of meant as like not interview questions that you would do in a job interview, but sort of like security practice questions and like uh, things to sort of test what kind of security you like and what kind of security you're good at. So like the first one is just kind of list 10 ways to turn off the light. This is sort of like an attacking sort of question, list 10 ways you could do it. But then we sort of get into more detail about how does the how does the light work? How can you tell if it's like so how does the light work is just like listing what is something and how to tell the light off. We talked about that. That's like how to detect if your thing is working how it's supposed to work. And the last one is oh, kind of an offensive one, but also sort of a defensive one because it's preventing someone else from being able to turn off the light. But you've done the first three already. So you suddenly have so much you've you like probably never thought as much about light bulbs or electricity as you in your whole life as you have right now. And so I hope this kind of gave you like some good practice or a good example of the kinds of things that you use when you're doing security as well. And we're going to talk about this more at the end as well. There's actually another one of these, but we can do it at the end or not do it at all because uh, I, we didn't have time and it, it sounds fun to do a jigsaw puzzle together instead. So let's do the rest of this talk. Let's just ignore that other one. Um, we can come back to it at the end if you really want. So why we did that, we just talked about it. Now for a completely disorganized, complete topic change, now that you're thinking about security, I hope you are, I hope you are kind of feeling a bit more like energetic after that. I know it was a lot to go through. We we're going to do two. Imagine that. That would be a lot to ask for you, 80 things. But I hope you're kind of feeling more hype and more energetic and like in a security frame of mind now. So now I just want to quickly go through off the top of my head, what are the various different kinds of security jobs you can do or things you can do when you know security? They're not all jobs, things you can do when you know about how computer security works. So the first one I came up with was security analysis slash incident response. Sometimes these are the same job, sometimes these are two jobs. But Basically, the way it works is you are the detective slash the police, and the hacker is a criminal, and you're trying to you know catch them or stop them from doing their stop them from doing their crimes. And so, some things you might do in that job are 
uh, so the way you detect what's kind of going on in your the computers you're trying to defend, uh, you have log files of, or you hope you have log files, you try and have log files of what all the computers are doing. And so you would write code or write alerts to analyze those log files and uh, to do something to tell a human if something suspicious happens. A really, really simple example of that is you might look for login attempts, people trying to log in to like some website, and you might write some code to do an alert if you see uh, the same, oh boy, how this, this is hard to explain, but like the same person uh, doing like 100 failed logins in a row, so fail, 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 and then they suddenly get success. Uh, and you might be thinking, hmm, well, maybe they're just guessing people's passwords, and maybe they get 100 incorrect attempts, and they suddenly get a correct attempt. Maybe that's maybe normal people don't do that. Maybe only people who are being sneaky hackers do that. Uh, that was not a particularly clever example of alert, but I hope it helped. And also, if you do get hacked, it says when you've been hacked. Hmm. Uh, when you do have been hacked, you get to play detective and answer the questions like, how did this person get in? Because like, kind of with the Twitter thing that's going on right now, right? Like, Twitter didn't get to know the beginning of the story, who tried to get in why. They just saw the president of, the, of America tweeting about Bitcoin, and they had to figure out, OK, what happened? How did the people get in here and do that? What did they do? Like, who? what else did they get access to? Was it just that Twitter account? It looks like the other ones. And finally, how do we get them out? Wow, do we get them out? Jeez, unprofessional. Moving on. Um, there's also another kind of security kind of area called, like people call it product security or application security or secure code. I don't know, stuff, something to do with secure coding. And uh, that job, that, that kind of area of security is about finding and preventing security vulnerabilities, like that eternal blue thing we talked about. Also, the Microsoft one that lets you uh, take control of any Windows computer. And so there are various things, like one way people do this is they you can't really read all the code that's out there. It's kind of too much code for humans to read. So people write code to read the code and decide if it's dangerous or not. So there's all these code scanning tools out there that try and detect vulnerabilities in your code before you actually publish them. But there's also, you could, the other way to do this is you just try and hack the software. And if you find a if you have hacked it successfully, then you found a vulnerability. That's another legit way to do it. You also might, Another, another thing people in this area might do is they might review security bugs. So like somebody else will tell you about, hey, I found this bug uh, called Eternal Blue. They probably wouldn't have a name for it yet. And it lets you uh, log into any, well, it lets you log in as anyone to, log in as root, sorry, to any Windows computer. And you would decide how bad is that? Uh, in this case, it's very bad. And you'd also critically decide how to fix this bug. Like what do I, how do I prevent whatever that Eternal Blue bug does from working? And uh, you typically would not fix them yourself. You would let the like, people who wrote the software fix it. But you would say, hey, by the way, to fix this software, uh, to fix this bug, here's what you need to do. Uh, so yeah, mainly your job is to help software developers write safer code, because the idea is to like, minimize security vulnerabilities. But also, it's not just the software developers. You also want to help the users have safer accounts. So you might do things like, we should let people log into, we should let people log into Discord or whatever with two-factor authentication as well. We should let them use a phone number for two-factor authentication if they want to. We should let them use their like special physical security key if they want to. We should let them do whatever. Those kinds of things. Another job you could do is a life of crime. I can't really recommend doing that. There are many downsides, like you know, some random hacker might be your boss, because these people do work in groups. They're not all just lone people. Uh, you can't really travel anywhere, because you get arrested if you go to the wrong country because the, you don't know who's trying to uh, arrest you or whatever. Also, not to mention that this is also illegal, highly don't recommend this path. There's also a thing called pen testing or penetration testing. You kind of going to get one shot to laugh at that joke. Uh, that joke, it's not even a joke. You kind of get one shot to laugh at that name. So kind of get it out of the way now. OK, great, we've done it. And so in this kind of job, you work with a bunch of hackers and then uh, another company, like you can do this internally, but I'm talking. I imagine uh, most people do this as like their own their own pen testing company, and so other companies will pay you to test the security of something they made. So they might say like, "Hey, what's up? We're a bank, and we're making a new banking app, and we want to know how secure is it? Are people going to hack us? Uh, what are there vulnerabilities in it? What, what what could go wrong?" Or they might say, "Hey, we have an office building. Could someone break into it? How could they break into it? How easy would it be?" And so on. So there's a whole job of people whose job it is to break into buildings uh, as if they are actually trying to break in and steal stuff. Uh, or they might, a lot, of, a lot of people want to have tests of fishing. They want to be like, yeah, fish our company. See if you can fish, how many people you can fish, see what you can fish them for, and so on. And then you write a report on all the different problems you found. You say, oh, well, we found this way to do this. We found this way to do this. And here's how bad we think it is. And here's another thing. And it, the well, a good thing about it is you get to, you have a lot of different um, like you try and hack lots of different places, right? Because like every every company that hires you to try and hack them, you get to, you have to learn about all how they work. So you get a lot of exposure to lots of different things. So it's a good thing to do, like 
uh, early because you learn lots of stuff about lots of different things. It's good to have that diversity so then you'll know what you like. Um, so there's also a thing, the, the other, like pen testing, the term pen testing and red teaming, which is what I'm about to say, get like people using to mean all kinds of different things. So these are just the definitions that I've seen. I'm sure you'll see people using them to mean different things. I'm very sorry that it's like this. And so in red teaming, just like pen testing, you work with a bunch of hackers. Uh, and that this is the this is the one I do, right? You try and guess what the real hackers are going to do to a company, and you do it first. And unlike pen testing, uh, so pen testing is like breadth first. You find all the different ways something could happen, or as many as you can, but you don't kind of do them all the way to completion. You don't actually like steal the data. Whereas red teaming is you just find you don't find all the ways. You find one way, but you do it all the way to the end. You do the whole attack all the way through. And then same thing, you write a report showing how you did it. Uh, the one good thing about this, or one good thing that I like about red teaming, is like you have many you have many goals, but one of them is to help the security team, like help the like detective team, improve and do better, right? As in, you give them like a safe way to practice their detection, because like you know, yeah, a real hacker isn't going to say, by the way, you missed this part. Um, it, I looked at what you detected, and hey, you didn't detect this part. They'll just hack you again. So it's good to have somebody to practice with and somebody who knows. This is just like a sparring partner, right? Um, and it's really useful. Um, another thing you could do is most of these jobs you could do working for the government. So ASD is the Australian version, which is the Australian equivalent of the NSA, who I'm sure you've heard about. Kind of cool because you get a license to do crimes in other countries. Like you're just allowed to like hack some random company in some other country for some reason. The government lets you do that. Uh, you get all the government's cool cyber weapons. Like if you worked at the NSA, you'd have access to that internal, eternal blue thing before everyone else did. So like they're not messing around. Uh, you get to spy on people if you love doing that. There's lots of boy governments can see lots of information that you put in a lot of places, but you do have to live in Canberra if you want to do this. So I don't know if I can truly recommend it. You hate to see it. There's also another thing which is like not a job, uh, not an official job, but which some people do. It's called doing bug bounties. So a bug bounty, if you haven't heard of it, is a um, program that some companies will do where they say like, hey, um, if you like, say, like, well, the company I work for does it. Atlassian does bug bounties, and we say, I don't actually know all the details, but they say, hey, if you find a bug in our software, like if you find a bug in the software or our website that we make or whatever. Uh, depending on what kind of bug it is, like if you find a remote code execution bug that's really bad, we'll pay you like big money. Like I don't know how much we pay, but like thousands of dollars for some things. Um, and the idea is that like why 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 would you why would a company do that? And because well, firstly, it's like they get to know about the bugs and they get to fix them. That's good before someone before someone nefarious uses them. Alex, if you can hear us, we can't hear you. Psych, don't worry about that. That wasn't the audio. The NSA tried to silence me, but I'm back. Um, no, see, don't worry, your audio is working fine. That's just me flubbing. Oops. Oh, someone in the chat says the NSA got me. Wow, okay. Um, I was talking about bug bounties, which the NSA didn't want you to know about, but I'm going to say it anyway. Basically, it's saying that um, hey, people who find bugs in our software, you should sell them to me instead of sell them to some other hacker who then uses them to hack us. And it's good. It's like, this is like a cool thing that you could, this is like a good way to like practice uh, a certain kind of hacking, right? Because you get to, well, let's keep going. So technically, well, by doing, technically you're unemployed, like you have no guaranteed employment. You only get paid for bugs that you find. Uh, you get to find bugs in big companies where you get to try at least. And then the company pays you to tell them what the bugs are instead of telling hackers. Uh, it's hard to do this full time unless you're like the best at a particular category because it's very like um, it's very capitalism. Only only one person gets paid per bug, so you have to be the first person to find it, or you have to be the first person to submit it, or whatever. So I don't know how good this is as like a way of making money, but I thought it was a cool thing that existed. There's also a bunch of security work in consulting, which is like a company wants to do better security or cyber or something, they're not really sure. And or they want to have their security reviewed, but not like pen testing, they just kind of want to tell someone about the security ideas rather than like actually test it. Um, or I mean, you, know, you can do consulting in any of these other companies. This is more like you talk, you, you kind of provide advice, right? And if the company, they don't have enough people who know security or they don't have enough people who know the kind of security that they want to know about. And so they ask, they consult with someone else who does know. 
and how you to know about those things and you give them advice you say oh yeah no the way you're doing this is fine or like oh i see that you're like you don't have two vector auth on this um oh and it's because it was really hard for you to get two vector auth because of this random other thing you were doing uh here i will help you get it in like a easier way for you like here there's an easy way you can get it that's easier than the way you're doing that kind of thing or sometimes they, they you give them advice or sometimes they're like no no no, just come and fix it for us here you go you just do it temporarily you just temporarily work for them and that's like a legit thing a lot of people do consulting as the incident response type thing so you're like detectives for hire so like when a company gets hacked they say help and then a bunch of you show up and try and figure out what the hackers did in this other company one negative thing people say about consulting all the time that i've heard is the client doesn't know what they want so there's a lot of like it's hard to communicate with someone well, it's hard to communicate accurately with someone who is asking you for security stuff, but they don't know exactly what, they don't know a lot about security, so they're not quite sure what they're asking sometimes. I've heard a lot of people who do consulting have problems with this part. Uh, another thing you could do is be a software developer. What? Really? Are you serious? But yep, it's true. That's right. You heard me. I'm saying it. You could be a software developer who also knows security, right? It doesn't have, it's not like your job, but like you happen to have like a background or interest or experience or something. And so this is cool because you're more likely to recognize the risky code that gets published. You're more likely to like write more safe code yourself. You're more likely to see when things go wrong and people will ask you things. Uh, basically, you'll be a godlike and everyone will be like, what? How did you do that? So this is also a legit way you can use your security knowledge that you now have. Or you can be an electrician now that we've practiced all of that. Uh, so at the very end of this talk is how do I learn these things? Like what are some of the ways? Kind of hard because like a lot of it is you having to understand something really, really well and teach yourself about it. But here are some things that helped me do that. Um, if you want to do CTFs, which are like sort of like sort of like real hacking, but sort of not, there's usually only one answer to a CTF. It can be kind of like a riddle, but it still lets you learn a lot about how something works. Here are some cool CTFs that uh, I saw online, but also you, there's going to be a UNSW CTF later and like you're in a CTF preparation workshop. So surely do that CTF first, surely. But here's some more. There's also uh, a paste link to all of these, which I think someone is going to put in the chat shortly, but here it is on the screen as well. Um, there's this, uh, one of the best ways that I've learned about things is by hearing about other people's first-hand hacking stories, like first-hand what happened. Um, this is a podcast that talks about real-life hacks. I don't know, it's only in podcast form for some reason, but it's really cool. It like has a lot of like real high-profile things, and they tell you all the details. It's great. Uh, also, you could read my blog post about things that I've done real hacks for. You don't have to do this, but this is my website. Um, there's, this talk, there's this talk and blog post I did called Operation Luigi, where I hacked one of my friends consensually and wrote about all about how it works. So that's the website. There it is. And oh, also, here's a bunch of hacking conferences you can go to. RIP. Here's a bunch of hacking conferences you can go to next year. For real, though, I, I learned so much from doing this. So a hacking conference is just like a bunch of hackers or hang out at the same place, which I know is highly cursed right now, but one day it won't be. And the people do talks and share the stuff they've done. And also people like the talks are like sort of important, but I hate to say this, but the real value is the friends you make along the way, right? Because you learn all about how they do it and what they think. And that kind of, you know, lets you see what's out there. Um, here's a bunch of the cool ones. Okay, so that's all that's all for the hacking resources. In conclusion, do not do crimes, the end. Uh, Evan is up to you now. No. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was very, a very good talk. I also learned a lot of like, how to be an electrician. Yeah, you're all electricians now. Wonderful. I needed that in my new apartment. Um, cool. Thank you for that. Um, so what we'll do next is um, go through the workshop material we've prepared for preparation for CTFs. Um, and then, oh, the stream's gone. I'm going to leave it at that. Um, and then, uh, and that will be until four-ish. And then we'll just, uh, if you all want to, like, ask Alex any questions, stick around on Discord. Um, and we'll probably do, like, a chill event where we can all just talk and um, ask questions or, like, about security, or I think Alex might be there. Is that right? Sure, I'll be around. Yeah, um, and we'll set that up afterwards. Yes, thanks for the electricity workshop. Cool. Um, but uh, I think we can start with the workshop. Ada, are you ready? Ada is deaf, but uh, we can't hear you, no.
Okay, is this one? Yes. Oh, I can hear myself in the Zoom call. Okay, I'm going to end it. Um, let me figure out how to watch the stream. Ah, okay. Anyone who still can't see, you should still be able to see everything. Oh. Um, yes. Before Ada starts, uh, we didn't realize that there is a streaming limit on um, voice chats. So, yes, you can hear me, but you can't see. Pin the link in the workshop text channel to the overflow Zoom link, um, and you can just watch it from there and do it or etc. Um, it's in announcements, is it? Yeah, I think oh, Adam put it in announcements. Good job, good job. Um, awesome. And I think think of anything else. So, yeah, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, sure. Um, so before I start, uh, I would like to reiterate, don't do crimes, but you can do the beginner CTF, which is this Saturday. And more information about that is on the Facebook event. Um, so this is super simple for anyone who like hasn't done a CTF before or hasn't done any security courses and you can learn on the way. But now... Um, oh, one more. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yes. On, on the yeah, topic like, of admin, uh, please fill yeah. out the uh, attendance form so that oh, CCSOC yeah. and us can um, get vibe some. this year. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. So, yeah, fill in the ARC form while I like, talk in the background. Okay, so um, what's going to happen for maybe the next hour? It might take a bit longer is that uh, SexSoc is just gonna do a quick crash course on how to do a CTF, uh, what a CTF is, and maybe some like t tips and tricks that you might be able to use for this coming CTF. So uh, the one on this Saturday that you can sign up to by checking out the Facebook event. Um, cool. So here's a list of uh, a bunch of kind of like categories that tend to uh, that like CTFs tend to have, or this is what our CTF is going to have. And I'm going to do a quick, maybe like 10 minute talk on cryptography. Um, to do so, who am I? Uh, my name's Ada, and I'm in my first year, so you're just gonna have to trust me. And awesome, cool. So, um, the basic idea of cryptography is pretty simple. So, you've got a secret key which uh, slides, yeah, we'll send you all the slides and resources and stuff. And you can have access to it like during the CTF as well. Um, okay, my screen's kind of small, so I'm not gonna look at the messages, but people will answer questions in the chat, surely. Yeah, awesome. So the basic idea of cryptography is you've got a secret key which converts some sort of information from like a readable form to some random garbage. And then you can send that to someone else and they can decrypt it and get the message out. And anyone listening in on the information can't find out about the information you're communicating. So here's like kind of four goals of cryptography. I found uh, so it's like confidentiality. You don't want someone else reading your secrets. Uh, you don't want someone else to like like change your secret and like tell tell someone else some like false information. And you, you want to like the other person to know that uh, it's actually you who's sending it. So not just some imposter pretending to be you. And um, not and so and also you want to make sure like the person can't deny that they've sent the message. Um, so one way to like one simple cipher that you've probably seen before, like, you know, the ones where you rotate it on like this circle thing is a Caesar cipher. So this is a symmetric system. Um, so there's like one secret that both parties have and you do something with the key that is like some secret information. You send it to that person and they decrypt it using the same key, but like basically your process in reverse. So as you can see on this example, you've got like uh, the keys like maybe you're shifting the alphabet three letters forward so like hello becomes this and you send 
call to the other person who can decrypt it. And they're like, oh, great, someone just sent me hello. Um, so there's this term called like cryptanalysis. I hope this is the right term, but I'm going to assume it is, which is like the art or process of deciphering coded messages without being told the key. So pretend you're not like either one of those people who are meant to like send the message or receive the message. You're just some random stranger and you're like, oh, cool, some like random garbage. I want to see what this message says. Um, so with like a Caesar cipher, uh, this is actually pretty simple. It's a crack. Uh, you could code up something that checks all the possibilities or you could like go online, type in Caesar cipher decipher and then put in like whatever that coded message is. And ta-da, you've got like a list of possibilities on what that coded message could be. So there's only 26 possibilities. Um, yeah, I wonder what that coded message says. Oh, can't find out. Oh, well, next slide, let's move on. Um, cool, so then you're like, oh, so there's only 26 possibilities. I'll just find something cooler, like a substitution cipher, which is basically like you map the uh you map like the letters to the scrambled version of the alphabet and so here in this version i've got hello as like x u o o b and look look at the maths that's like a really big number there's like 26 factorial possibilities there's absolutely no way that someone else could find out what my secret message is unless like you're the person i meant to send it to right well wrong because english oh i guess if you change it to like some other alphabet or some other like language, maybe that's like another form of encryption. But if you're sending an encrypted English message and you've just used a substitution cipher, what you can do is like analyze the um, frequency of the letters or like the frequency of words. So like you've got letters that are more common together, like the and and ing are more common than like la la or whatever. So here's like a random passage. Um, could I send in chat? Nah. Um, yeah, so you've got like GSV happening so many times. Wow, three letter word. I wonder that, what that could be. And once you figure out like what each letter is, you could figure out the rest of the message, right? Um, so I think like there are ways you could, oh, if, you're, if you did Comp 1511 or you're doing Comp 1511, one of the challenge exercises is like to write a, uh, so a decryption for a substitution cipher. And like the way you would do that is just take a look at known um, encryptions and ha like the frequency of letters and analyze that and come up with like some cool match thing. Um, and yeah, and you could like decrypt the cipher that way. So it's like, what else could you do? Um, you could have like a book cipher. So in Sherlock, oh, is this a spoiler? You know what? This is like a couple years ago. So surely, surely not a cipher uh, that big of a spoiler. So in, oh, so in one of the episodes, they had like some secret code and they're like, oh my gosh, I wonder what this, like, what this could mean. And, but what they figured out was like, okay, block it is for like, until I switch the slides, if you don't want spoilers, but it's like, oh, so like this number corresponds to a page in a book that everyone has. And then the second number is like the word in the book. And then they've like put together a secret message. So that's really cool. So that's like, if you see, say for example, a challenge with like two numbers or, and then you've got like a link to some article or a song, I don't know, just hypothetically, it maybe it could be a book cipher. But then um, the problem with these things is like, we have to know, we both have to know what the key is. So say for example, if I wanted to like, so you and I, I want to send you some secret message, um, but then uh, I have to tell you what the key is. So I guess we could like meet up in a park and then swap envelopes. Um, but the first thing is it's very inconvenient. And the second thing is like, how do I send, um, like, like what if I, like, what if like we don't live near each other or you? I want to send this online. So I, I want to send the key to you without sending the key in the clear but then you need a secure encrypted connection to send the key, but then you need the key to have a secure encrypted connection. So it's like, oh, what, what do I do? Um, so there's this, like, so here's kind of like the cryptographic primitives. Um, so you've got, uh, what I've mainly been talking about is like symmetric keys, like cipher, so we, ciphers, so we, uh, like the Caesar cipher and the substitution cipher, where we both have the same key and like the same secret, and you can work from that.
But there's something like that's really cool called an asymmetric system. So what that does is you actually have two keys um, and anything you encrypt. So you've got like a public key and a private key and anything you encrypt with key A can only be decrypted with key B. Um, so there's like really cool maths, but I'm not going to go into it. But Eddie Wu has like made a pair of videos. So if you watch that, like you'll probably understand it pretty well. Uh, yeah, so there's you've got like a pair of keys. So if I have a key pair and you have a key pair and I wanted to share a um, share like or you wanted to share me a message um, instead of just like meeting up in secret and like shiftily changing and getting like one secret what you could do is you can encrypt like your message with my public key and the and only i can read it with my private key um so you encrypt bob has encrypted the message with the public key and then with the private key you can like decrypt whatever message was encrypted with the public key so yeah uh and the second thing you could do is like i could uh encrypt something with my private key and then publish it and you might be thinking like what, what what's the point if the public key is out there anyone can decrypt that message but then the fact that it can be decrypted with the private key means that you know it's me and that it's an authentic message and like one of the and then when you do both so if i encrypted something with my private key and then your public key then uh, i'll know that you're the only one who can read the message and that that message was sent from me. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned before, Eddie Wu has like a really great video on how they do it with like maths. I think the short spoiler version is like it's something to do with prime numbers. And yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, and that's the end of my segment. So I'm going to pass it on to whoever's next. Um, but if you have any questions, yes, uh, feel free to like message me later or like come to the CTF. And uh, or you could just Google it, which is what I did for most of my presentation. So yeah, cool. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, soon. Um, if you have any questions, you can also leave them in chat, and especially during my talk, because I'll have chat open. Let me just share um, my. Okay, my stream should be up. Uh, let me know if... Oh, is my volume a bit low? Uh, I can hear you clearly. Oh, cool. Let me just get super close to my mic then. All right. Uh, just ASMR. The stream button. I'll give you one minute to join. Okay, I think we're good to go. So I'm going to be taking you through quite a few sections. So the first section we're going to go through is forensics. So trying to find hidden or missing information in files. And a pretty common concept which comes with, introdu with introductory forensics is steganography. So steganography is trying to hide information in image files. And image files make a really, really good candidate for hiding information because they can take up several megabytes and not be suspicious. So you've got millions of bytes to work with. And if you think about it, each ASCII character only needs one byte to be encoded. So if you took some bytes from the image to hide your message, you could get by pretty discreetly. So we're going to look at some methods to do that. Well, we're going to look at one method. But first, we need to understand how images work. So images are made of pixels, and each pixel has three subpixels. And they represent the amount of redness, the amount of grayness, and the amount of blueness of that individual pixel. And for each subpixel, we can represent the color with one byte. So that's eight bits, and eight bits gives you 256 values per subpixel. And if you adjusted the last bit of a subpixel, for example, a red subpixel, then you'd only change the redness by one 256. 
So you could make tiny, tiny changes to an image and chances are no one's going to notice it. So let's try and hide the letter H using uh, eight, eight subpixels from an image. Uh, I know that's his first seven, but that's meant to say eight. Okay, so here we've got eight subpixels and we've got their red values listed out. So they're just random numbers, okay? And yeah, so those are the bit values for each of the numbers and I've converted it to decimal for you on the right. And our goal is to encode the letter H in lowercase. And if you pull up your ASCII table, you've got 100, uh, we've got 104 as the ASCII value in decimal. So we want to hide the number 104 somewhere in here. So we look at this ASCII, ASCII value and we've got 011, 01000. So what we do is we change the first bit to zero, then we change this to, a, we keep this as a one, keep this as a one, change this to a zero, change this to a one and keep the rest as zeros. So if you do that, see, we've changed all of these bits, but the values of the decimals have barely changed, right? Like some of them are still the same. The rest have changed by one. And realistically, you're not going to notice a change of one. So it's a really, really good way of hiding information in images. So this method is called least significant bit steganography. And the reason it gets that name is because we're manipulating the least significant bit or the smallest bit of each pixel. And there's heaps of types of steganography, and that also changes because some, some image formats use compression to make files take up less space. Okay, so that allows you to use heaps of, several, heaps of different <laughs> most significant bit. No, okay, so yeah, that gives you heaps of methods of hiding uh, information in images. And you've got several tools online which can help you try and look for information in images. But some more uh, complex forms of steganography will require you to download tools. Uh, there's, a, there's a piece of software called Steg Tools. I think it's available on Linux, and that tests, that tests several methods to find hidden information. Um, next, we've got metadata. So uh, if you do Comp1521, this probably just came up in the last lecture, but uh, metadata, oh, uh, metadata uh, stores extra information about a file. So a classic example is if you look at a JPEG file, uh, you'll find information about perhaps the camera, where it was taken, when it was taken, etc. So it's always worth looking through the exif data to see if there's any hidden information about the image. Uh, here is a classic example of people uploading information in exif data and not realizing. So Huawei uh, shot a photo, said it was from their phone, but it really wasn't. Uh, another case we're going to look at is flipped bits. So this is another forensics example. It's pretty classic in CTFs. So uh, generally, you'll be provided some kind of file, but something's wrong with the file. So you have to figure out what's wrong. And a classic solution to this kind of question is looking at the first few bytes of file, because those bytes told the computer what to do with a file. So it gives the computer really important information. And some file formats have extra important information in headers. So each file format might have like a uh, specific uh, specific length and locations where they store information. So uh, something that's probably worth looking at is a list of file signatures. And if you can see, the first one here is also the Sexdoc logo. So that's pretty cool. I'll have a link to this in the document I share at the end of the presentation. So part three, we're, we're going to talk about Linux. So using Linux to find secrets. Uh, so there's probably a decent few first years and you might not have Linux at home, but you can always use your CSC machine to be able to run challenges. So uh, we'll give you instructions on how to do that. And I believe that the CSC machine has everything that you need installed already. Okay, so the first concept we're going to look at is environment variables. So environment variables are like system-wide variables used to store information. and Pretty much any program can access environment variables on a computer. Uh, sometimes uh, developers will use environment variables to store secrets, so it's always worth poking around for environment variables. And if we want to list all the environment variables, we can use a terminal. So let me pull up a terminal. Here we go. And the command is print env. And if we look through, oh wow, you found my secret. Congratulations. Okay, so. Uh, next slide we've got is grep. So grep is a super powerful tool for uh, searching strings. And the thing with grep is, like, uh, if you want to get a full understanding of grep, you probably should take COM2041. 
uh, because they go into depth with that, but you can do some basic searches. So say that we have a lot of files in a folder and we want to look for phrase top secret. Okay, so let's pretend that this folder has a lot of files. I'm going to run this grep command. So grep i, so that's ignoring uh, lowercase slash uppercase. And we're going to look for top secret. And we're going to search for every file in this directory. So we use the asterisk like that. And look, we found our top secret code here. Uh, next slide we've got is strings. So here we've got a scenario which links back to the cryptography segment from earlier. So Bob's sending an encryption program to Alice and thinks that no one can read the key from within the encryption program because it's, it's a compiled file. So you think, oh, I can't read any information from a compiled file. Uh, but there are some useful tools which can help you here. So this tool is called strings. So say that I have this program and it can encrypt my message. So I will type in hello world and it gives me some form of cipher back, okay? So I'm gonna inspect the binary using this tool called strings and strings is gonna find any strings that it finds within the program. So there we go. And we use strings like this. Okay, so we've got a bunch of random things. Well, it seems to be random things, but really these are strings that the compiler adds to a program. Uh, for example, these are text labels. And if we scroll up, wow, we can see that there's some kind of function in here called substitution cipher. So that tips off, that tips us off to the fact that this program is using some form of a substitution cipher. And we scroll around, we see encrypt your message so that only I can read it. And on the next line, we've got a key and it has every single letter of the alphabet. So maybe we've got the key for our substitution cipher. Yes, that is obviously the lesson I'm trying to get across. Um, so yeah, a TLDR, so don't distribute programs using symmetric encryption keys. And as Ada mentioned, that's why we have asymmetric keys for many cases, such as the internet. Okay, so the next command line tool I'm talking about is Git. Git isn't necessarily a security tool, but there is a lot of potential for security flaws when using Git. So Git is a source control tool. And basically what Git allows you to do is maintain older versions of the file that you have within a directory. So we call directories that Git is looking after um, as repositories, okay? And developers all around the world use Git to track changes to their code, uh, merge changes from other developers. So it's also useful for collaboration and you'll probably use it for group projects like Comp1531. And each Git directory has a hidden folder called .git and .git stores information about, the Git, uh, about changes to your files. So sometimes developers can actually accidentally upload their .git files to .git folders to their web servers. So you might have access to file history that you're not supposed to. And other times people accidentally put files with secrets in their Git repositories without realizing. And since Git tracks file history, removing secrets from your history is a bit difficult. So we're gonna talk about part four, which is the web. So this allows us to find secrets on the interwebs. Um, so first we're gonna look at GitHub. So GitHub is a service which lets you uh, maintain your Git repositories online so others can see and use it, or you can make it private so you, that you can access your files from Git on other computers. But uh, if they accidentally push secrets, well, then they're pushing their secrets to the web. And a lot of the time you can find random passwords, SSH keys, a bank account details, or cryptocurrency wallets. So uh, if a CTF involves GitHub, it's always a good idea to check through the GitHub history in case someone pushed a secret in the past and removed it and forgot to uh, clear their history of it. Uh, there's also a few methods to avoid pushing secrets. If you're ever working on a project and you've got a secret in a folder, uh, you can either store that secret as an environment variable so that it's not in the folder and therefore Git can't track it. Uh, for example, uh, right now we're working on a bot for sex arc. So if I go, and uh, we need to use an authentication token for Discord. So instead of storing the authentic authentication token here, what we do is we store it as an environment variable. 
Okay. Uh, another example is using a .git .git ignore file. So that prevents Git from realizing that your file exists, and therefore it can't push it to the internet. So that's protecting your secrets. Uh, one more thing we're going to look at is robots.txt. So robots.txt is just a file that exists on most websites online, and that tells web crawlers slash searches slash spiders and other automated other automated web scrapers as to what pages they're allowed to access. For example, uh, for Google to know that your web page exists, it has to crawl the internet to try and find it. But sometimes you don't want Google to go and look at your pages. So what you do is you create a robots.txt file and you tell Google what pages it's still allowed to access and what pages it's not allowed to access. So for example, Facebook has a robots.txt file. And if you look at it, um, Facebook doesn't want you to know what photos you have, for example. So. I mean, Facebook doesn't want Google to know where all the photos are, so it tells it not to index it. So, yeah, you could write a program that completely ignores the existence of robots.txt, but you might get a lawsuit from Facebook because they're not happy that you breached their terms of service. And the last thing we're going to look at is stalking. So some challenges might require you to stalk perhaps fake people. And so that's just letting you put your internet detective skills to the test. and since you're probably already an expert at this, um, I think I can leave you to that. So that's it for my section. I think next up we've got Tom with WebSec. Is that right? Uh, is it Tom or is it me? It might Who be Matt. Ready? Uh, I'm mostly ready. Um. Right, so do we just want to start on my bit? Yeah. Uh, okay, so we're just going to have to switch to sharing my screen here. Uh, what are all these settings? Okay. Uh, oh, hang on, I'm also recording, so I've got to switch my stream. Uh, cool, you should all be able to see my terminal now. Uh, yeah. So this is just um, SSH'd into... Oh, I can hear myself. It's, okay, I can't hear the audio anymore. I just took out my earphones because I could hear myself with the delay. So I'm just SSH'd into the CSC machines here. Uh, so everything I do here, you'll be able to do on the CSC machines yourself. You don't need any special software or anything to do this. All right. Uh, so to get started, I'm going to be talking about reverse engineering as well as binary exploitation. So the basic idea with these kinds of, I guess, in the CTF context, these kinds of challenges is you'll be given a program and you'll generally have to try and understand how it works. Uh, often there will be, in the case of binary exploits, there'll be some kind of bug in the code and your job will be to find the bug and then use that bug to give you access to the system on which it is running in some way. And in reverse engineering, generally it's not so much about finding bugs, but just understanding what the program is actually doing. So then you can, uh, I guess, find things that they don't want you to know about how the program works. So this might be some kind of like a password authentication system, and you can somehow understanding that, figure out what the password is, stuff like that. And so to start off with, we have a sample just like what I said. I have a program I wrote here called Locked. We don't have the source code for it, but we can see it asks us for a password. If I type in please, it won't give us the uh, won't give us what we want. All right. Uh, so, what was I going to say? Uh, yeah. So it's not going to tell us what the password is. So we're going to have to do something a little bit more devious in order to try and figure it out. As a bit of a quick side note, uh, usually reversing challenges will use Linux binaries. Uh, if you get a file with no extension, it's often safe to assume it's a Linux binary. Like here, it's just called locked. There's no .exe or anything. Um, of course, it's um, not so safe to just run random binaries that you get. However, our beginner CTF shouldn't have any malicious binaries in it, so I wouldn't worry too much about that just yet. But it is a good idea to get like a virtual machine or something, something set up. If you do want to be running, uh, if you do want to, yeah, shouldn't in italics. Ooh, oops, I resized the window. 
Um, yeah, good idea to use a virtual machine though when running random binaries that you get in CTF challenges. Uh, but if you don't have a virtual machine set up yet, that shouldn't be too much of a concern. And then how can we actually look inside this binary, right? Because if we just try and say open it in Vim, and I hope this doesn't go crazy. Okay, yeah, this isn't this isn't helpful. This isn't helping anyone. I see there's an elf in here. Uh, we've got Naum as well as Ekli. I, I don't think this is going to really get us very far. So Vim is sadly not our answer here. Uh, however, thankfully there are programs that we can use to inspect non-text files. Uh, there's quite a lot out there. You can Google like hex editor or hex viewer. There's a billion on the internet. Uh, however, there's one that comes pre-installed on basically all Unix machines called XXD, which is what I'm going to use for the moment. And we just say XXD locked. It will just print out a full binary dump. Now this isn't too useful, but if we maybe pipe this into less, uh, we can see a whole bunch of crap. There's a couple of bits of text there. It says Linux x86, so it's probably an x86 Linux binary, actually x86-64. I see some function names here. That could be useful. A um, whole lot of nulls here, but there are some bits of text in here. And you probably remember before Abiram mentioned the strings command. So that could also be useful. We saw there were some function names and stuff. Maybe we could get a bit of a better idea. Oop, I did that again. Uh, no, what have I done? Maybe we could get a bit of a better idea of what's inside this by using strings. And so if we do use strings on our binary, we can see uh, there's a bunch of just random garbage. Uh, we can see, oh, uh, please enter the password. And then we see the string lock and key. And then congrats, the flag is, and then sorry, that's not it. Hmm, well, this is probably something that it displays to do with the flag. This is asking for the password. I wonder what this could be. So again, I mean, it could be the password, it could not be. It doesn't hurt to try it. So often there might be several kind of candidates, but sometimes you can just type in the password that you get, and that will work. Sometimes you might find the flag via strings. Sometimes the password might be encrypted in some way when you see the strings, and so you'll have to figure out how to decrypt it. Maybe the names of functions could be a hint as to how that password is encrypted. Um, and as the flag kind of hints at us here, um, don't store passwords in plain text because someone can just get them as strings or really any sort of way. Plain text is not a good idea for storing passwords. Uh, in before people try this flag at the CTF. Uh, as something that I don't think was mentioned also, is one way to know if you've actually found the solution is often it will have a kind of flag format like this. You'll see these curly braces. So that can be a bit of a hint if you've found the flag. If you see a bunch of like uh, garbled nonsense with these curly braces, it's probably the flag but encrypted in some way. So that can be kind of a hint that you're on the right path. Um, now, there's a little bit more I want to talk about reverse engineering. I won't demo that bit, but just to kind of talk about it. Uh, sometimes this won't be enough and you do need to go a bit further in. So there's tools like object dump and I'll just briefly show, oh, I did it wrong. Uh, pass dash, not object jump, object dump dash D locked. This will show you all of the assembly that's within there. You can also see every function. So you can see here's our main function. It tells us the address of the function. This information as well as all the instructions in it can be useful if like you really need to dig in deep. And um, more challenging questions will be like that. I don't think there'll be too much like that in our CTF. Um, but if you do really need to get into details like that, there are better tools than using ObjDump. So there's um, Binary Ninja and uh, Cutter. I think, did we have a workshop on Cutter some time ago? Or No, I think that was 6447 I'm thinking of. Uh, there are tools that are a bit easier than just looking at all of this text listed here. Those tools will kind of give you a flow chart that shows each of the instructions, but also shows a sort of overall control flow. And so by identifying like where the code forks would be like an if statement, or you can see where it loops back on itself, they can give you some ideas as to what the algorithm is and can be helpful in just understanding the general logic of code without having to read every single instruction. However, we won't go, we won't really go into that at all here because this challenge we could get by with just using strings. Um, if it's written in a language like Python or Java or C Sharp or a couple others, you can actually get what's called a decompiler for those languages. So what that will do is it will take your actual binary file and produce source code that is similar 
to the original source code. So it may not be identical, variable names might be changed or something. However, it will have the same overall structure and is much, much easier to read than disassembly. So if when using strings, you see maybe like a bunch of stuff talking about Java or a bunch of stuff talking, actually, I think with Java, it would be a .jar file. We see a bunch of stuff talking about Python, then you know maybe you want to like Google up how to um, decompile those programs in order to get back the original source code because that would be way easier to understand than trying to work with um, just the disassembly. Uh, so I'll move on to the next part of this, which is talking about um, binary exploits. So generally with exploits, they won't just give us the um, flag even if we know the password or something like that. For these, we have to exploit, as it's called, some kind of bug, some kind of vulnerability. So this can be a little bit more technical. Um, understanding uh, the content from Comp2, not 25, um, 1521 can be very useful for this, especially how stacks work. Uh, so if you don't mind, I'm actually going to switch my screen sharing, if I can. Oh, change windows. I don't even need to stop and start again. Isn't this wonderful? Uh, screens, share full screen. Uh, so this should be my full screen. Cool, cool, cool. Hopefully you didn't see anything too sensitive there on my Discord. Uh, so here I've got a little bit of a diagram. This is just a basic idea of how a stack works. It's oversimplified, but good enough for our purposes. So you might remember in uh, from 1521, in a C program, all of the variables and stuff are stored on the stack. And the stack actually grows from the highest address downwards or like backwards. It, people argue over which direction is which. I'm just going to say this is the top and this is downwards. So we start out at the top of our sort of address space. In this case, I've called that FFFF, and we work backwards. And if, say, main were to call another function, that function's variables would be added on, just like underneath where main was. And then say this printf function that we called was to call the puts function, then it would appear there. So as we call them, they will appear back before here. And then when it returns, they'll get popped off the stack. So it's kind of like a stack of the cards, a stack of cards, starting from here and then growing that way. Now, you might think this is kind of unnecessary detail, but often it's just little bits of the unnecessary details that can prove to be very, very juicy. So I'm actually going to go back to my actual source code first, and then I'm going to show my source code with reference to the diagram. So for this challenge, we haven't been given the binary, but we have been given the source code. And so we can see here's our source code. I'm going to just zoom in a bit in case it's a little bit blurry. Uh, that should be a bit easier to see. So we've been given some source code. Um, nothing too amazing. It's just we have a array that is stored. Note that it's stored on the stack. This isn't malloped. If ever you see something that's not malloped, then it will be stored on the stack. And this takes in eight characters, so eight bytes. Then we have an integer that just stores the value zero. Uh, integers will be four bytes on most systems. And so you can see we print out what's your name, uh, ignore the flush, and then the gets will ask the user for their name. You may have heard people to tell you to never use gets, and that is very good advice, and we will see why. Then finally, we'll print out, haha, sorry, but you'll never get my flag. Why? Because the only way to print the flag is if 0 is equal to 42. Sadly, that is impossible unless we redefine the laws of mathematics, or if we overflow a buffer. So we want to print out the flag, right? Because that's what we want. That's how we get the points. That's how we win. However, 0 is going to be equal to 0, even if, if we just try and run this. And actually, I'll go on a little bit of a side tangent here. Uh, let me just run a little hidden script. Uh, often you'll be given instructions on how to connect, and we'll say uh, netcat uh, some IP, um, likely not this exact IP, and then some port perhaps. And you will just execute that. You'll often just be given this line and told to execute it in a terminal somewhere. What that will do is it'll connect you to a server that's running the binary. So you don't have the binary yourself, but it's being run on a server somewhere, and this just lets you connect to the server. Uh, so if I actually run this, you can see it'll ask me for my name. So I enter in Matt, and of course, 0 is not equal to 42, so we don't get the flag. How could we make 0 equal to 42, though? Well, if you look back at this, I'm just going to 
add on this little extra bit of diagram here. And this is our different variables and such in the program. So you can see we have our name array and we have our integer zero. There's also two other values that will exist. The our compiler will always add in a sort of base pointer thing and a return address thing. I'm not going to go into too much details on these for now, but I will quickly touch on them a bit later. Let's just focus on this int zero and this char name here. So we can see I typed in my name as Matt. It put my name into this name eight array. And then it checked this integer zero with 42. And zero was not equal to 42, so we were fine. However, what if we weren't quite playing by the rules? This array has a size of eight. And when we actually read in the user input, if I just get back up my vim, uh, we can see we're using gets with name. However, arrays in C don't really have a size. They do have a size when they're allocated, but when you pass them around, it's just a pointer. Gets doesn't know how long this array is. So I could type in my name as Matt, and Gets would be happy. I could type in my name as uh, Jennifer, and Gets would be happy. I could type in my name as Ah, uh, and Gets still would be happy. It doesn't know that the array is only eight bytes. So I could type in ah uh, like this, uh, maybe a little bit excessive. But if I were to type in more than eight characters, just kept pressing ah, uh, what might happen? Uh, and actually, I'll make this a little bit interactive. Anyone want to guess what would happen? Can't see anything. Hopefully, it's still working for everyone, working on my second screen. Uh, what might happen if we just type in a bunch of r's? Overwrite other variables. Yes, we will overwrite other variables. So you can see our int, our base pointer, and our return address. We can override all of these with whatever the hell we want, because we're in control of what we type in. And there's no input validation being performed on here, nothing to limit the size of what we type in. This is quite wonderful. So let's think of how we can exploit this. And let's quickly check the chat. Oh, no, everything's fine. Uh, so let's think of how we can exploit this. So we want to get inside the if statement, we want 0 to be equal to 42. However, 0 is equal to 0 initially. Yet we can change this value of 0. If we type in, I can demo here, if we type in uh, more than 8 a's, then these additional a's will overwrite 0 here. Uh, however, we want this to be equal to 42. And a, 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 a is not equal to 42, unfortunately for us. So we're going to have to do a little bit more work here. Now let's actually consider what 42 would look like if it were to be inside this integer 0. So let me just get my uh, text tool up. So ideally, we want the number... Wait, why is the text that tiny? Nobody knows. So ideally, we want the value 42 in here. However, keep in mind that 42 is an integer, whereas we're typing in text. So we're going to have to try and think about the internal representation of this value within the computer. So an integer, as I said before, is stored as four bytes. Uh, so if you look at an integer like 42, we can decode this into four bytes in hexadecimal. Um, what's an easy way to convert to hexadecimal? Uh, maybe if I just pop up Python 3, we can say hex 42 is our 2a. So in memory, what we want to do is overwrite the zeros with 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 2a, as this is the value of 42 in hexadecimal. Uh, now, I kind of want to ask a trick question to see if anyone can spot what's wrong with this. Um, why is char array stored below the int? Uh, so the stack will kind of grow backwards. We start at the highest address and things will go downwards to lower. Char name will be stored below the integer. I think it's mainly to do with the order of definition within the C file. So in this case, we're lucky enough that it will be stored above it. Uh, but it does depend on the exact details of your program. It's a little bit harder. Actually, you can't really overwrite things that are below the buffer that you're overwriting, but you can write overwrite, you can overwrite things that are above. And there's one very, very juicy thing that will always be above your buffer. So this is a very nice thing to overwrite. But sometimes you can also just overwrite values here, which can be a bit simpler. Um, but like I was mentioning here, we have our value 42. 
and we have this encoded as hexadecimal here. Uh, there's a little bit of a catch. On x86, as well as some other systems, I think ARM, not MIPS or PowerPC. Actually, MIPS is another, I think, 50-50. Anyway, sometimes values won't be stored this way, but they'll actually be stored flipped in what's called little endian. So little endian is where the smallest byte comes first, or like the smallest um, sort of meaningful byte. So this has the least meaning. It's like multiplied by 1, whereas you can think of this being multiplied by 256, multiplied by 65,000, and I don't know what this is multiplied by off the top of my head. But these like more significant um, binary digits, or hexadecimal digits, uh, on the left side here. But with little endian, we basically store values reversed, which means 42 would be stored as 2A000000. Uh, this is something to keep in mind. Uh, basically, all pointers you will have to flip, um, all integers you'll have to flip, basically every sort of like four byte value you're going to have to flip around if you're working on a little endian system, and most are, especially all x86 ones are. So we will have to flip this around, which means we want to overwrite these zeros with this 2a000000. And so how might we do that with text? Well, we can actually look up our um, ASCII table, is what I meant to say, not hex table, ASCII table. If you type in ASCII, we actually get a very convenient ASCII table. And looking through this, we can see the ASCII code here, uh, 2a is asterisk, and we can see in decimal it's 42. So the decimal value 42 corresponds to 2a in hexadecimal, which is asterisk in ASCII. So what this means is we could try inputting star here, and hopefully what that will do is it will overwrite just this very first byte here with 2a. So let's give that a spin. And I think I'm going to have to run my setup script one more time. So if we net cat in again, we can type in a a a a a a a a. That is eight a's, so it will fill up all of this first part of the buffer. And now we are starting to overwrite int zero. So if we put in a star and enter, oh look at that, we've got the flag. So what we've done there is we've overridden this first byte with two a, which will cause this to contain the value two a blah blah blah, which will, when compared with 42, be equal, because it is 42. And so our code, we just look at it one last time. What is it called? Flow1.c. Our code, we can see 0 will be overridden with 42, so we'll have 42 equal to 42, and thus our flag will be printed. Uh, that's most of what I wanted to say. Just as one uh, final thing. Uh, there's some really good websites for just practicing uh, like binary exploitation and reversing. Uh, here's a good one, uh, exploit.education. They've got a bunch of different security sort of challenges. Good practice for getting into CTFs. Uh, there's also a ton of other websites like this, so you can just Google it, find other websites. I'm sure other people in the chat can probably suggest really good websites for this. Uh, and if binary exploitation is something that interests you, we do have an entire course on just this one topic. I think that about wraps it up, though. Do we have any questions? Uh, a bunch of people saying Andy in this, but that was a couple minutes ago. Yeah. Uh, we still have uh, yes, time to cover one. On Andy in this. Uh, those were answers, yeah. Okay, cool. Oh, yeah, Andy in this will be a bit of a problem, so you do need to make sure. Basically, if it doesn't try one way, just flip all the bytes around and give it another go. I think that's about it for what I have to say. I don't know if there's anything sensitive on this window, so maybe I shouldn't be showing it. But then I can't read the chat. This is a. I'll stop showing my screen then, actually. Uh, oh. Oh, oh, yeah, I also can't hear anyone at the moment. Hello. Oh, yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, all right. Um, so let me try. <clears throat> yeah. Binary exploitation is a bit difficult. Um, so if you didn't catch all of that, we'll probably do another workshop another time, or feel free to ask any other questions. All right. <clears throat>
Might wait a bit. Um, Don't to go too in depth, Tom. Yeah, yeah. So I'll try to go through this quickly as I have a few like live demos to show at the end if they don't break. But um, so all I've said um today, I'm gonna go through some injection and basically whatever. So you wanna like wait so you can try to run whatever you want on other people's vulnerable applications. Not that you should do that. Um, all right, how do I, oh. oh, okay. So I'll go through some SQL injection first. So it's a common OS vulnerability, which is, um, I think it's like top 10. I forgot what it was exactly, but um, it just allows you to run some database queries on someone else's server. So that is SQL, first of all. So it's a way for you to retrieve data and modify data within the database. And like um, you can do all sorts of stuff with it. Um, if, right, so if um, you input some invalid data, so you're able to take over control of the database and then like read records that you're not meant to read. If the developer does a bad job of writing the database calls, or not sanitizing the input. So like we have a normal query here. So we want to select a user called with a username called Bobby. Um, so like the last part where username equals Bobby is what the user inputs. So the user just inputs the Bobby part. But if they try to input something else like Bobby quotation mark or one equals one. Um, they are able to like um, they're able to insert their own like little part of the query. And this, um, if the input is not like sanitized properly, they will retrieve the first user in the database. Um, all right. So another thing about um, this is you can also like be boring if you just look at one table and you won't really find much. So you can pivot around to other tables using the union select um, operator. So with this, um, so we have our original query, which is the select email from, from users where username equals. Um, so to say we wanted to like check um, what the other tables were within the database. Um, for MySQL, you just run, you look at a table called information schema dot tables, and there's a column called table name, which you can query to list all the tables from the database. Um, also, um, by doing this, you can also figure out like what database system um, the application is using, which can be important as it allows you to craft your exploits specifically for that database. So in SQLite, which is what most CTF challenges use because it's easier to set up. So there's a table called SQLite master instead of information schema dot tables, uh, which contains like the same information. All right, so what else can you, wait, so what can you do to like, Take yourself from it. Um, so use parameterized queries so that variables are never actually injected into the SQL, but are sent separately. So like you just put a question mark in some like query engines, and like also always sanitize and validate your inputs because that's always a good way to make sure that users cannot exploit your application. All right, so I'll also go through like some server side template injection. So this is like a bit more dangerous as it actually allows you to run like code, like not just create a database. So like you have like higher privileges, like when you can run code on someone else's server most of the time. So yeah, so what are templates? Um, so like if 
um, a web developer had to write out like every page manually. It would be like a lot of hard work. So you had to like duplicate a lot of code. So, like every page has a header, footer, um, like some common template stuff, script. And if you wanted to modify something, you would have to go through and change like every single part of every page you wanted to modify. So that's why we have templates to so that we can reuse like the common parts. But where this falls short is that sometimes if the developer just reads in the template and does some string replacing within the template itself. And try to render that. Um, they will get you'll be able to get some code injection, which means that you are able to run your own code on the web server. Um, so, like a way to normally test is that you can run a mathematical expression that would evaluate to like something. So, for example, seven times seven, like. If you put that in an import, it would like evaluate to 49. And like I'm doing it based on Python for now, but you, there's like you can do it also in PHP um, and many other languages which have template stuff. Um, all right, so like in Flask, there's a variable called config which um, what, so the variable config, um, it has like all the secret keys and like other things. Let's see the chat. Um, so you can use config to like list the secret key, um, which you can use to sign your own cookies. And also like you can also run other magic stuff. So say you want to like run LS on the server. So you can like go through Python's internals to access like the right class and then use it to like run a program. So um so you actually have to craft your exploits specifically for um the application as like these numbers change, obviously. Um yeah. Uh, wait, why the all right, so what can you do with SSTI? So, I mean, what what can you do to protect yourself? Um, so don't mix up template and markup. So that ensures separating context. And that means like goes without saying to not run untrusted code and like sanitizing imports again. So also goes a long way from protecting you from this. And we have some further resources. So, I'm going to demo like to do SQL injection ex exercises, which he has kindly given me permission to demonstrate. Um, I don't think we might have time. Oh, so we don't have time now? I think it's over time. Um, um, all right, so I might do I think the, the slides were really good. Oh, yeah. Uh, so basic the slide. idea, though. So that's fine. All right, so I guess that's it for now, because we don't have that much time to go through the demo. Um, yeah, thank you all for coming. Um, if you are interested in seeing the demos or um, talking, playing jigsaws with us while uh, Answering questions and asking questions. Uh, yes, and feel free to stick around. Uh, otherwise, please make sure to fill out the uh, attendance form for, for ARC. And finally, uh, uh, please, if you're interested in security, please come along to Saturday's CTF. Um, the questions will be beginner friendly and will be there to help out um, mainly as a educational exercise. So um, we do have some prizes, but they're not of high value. They're kind of just like congrats. Um, yeah, it'll be cool if we all see you around. I think that's more or less about it, unless I'm missing anything.
Um, oh, if you're on CTF event, yes. We'll find it. If you are on Zoom, um, the Discord channel is uh, under limit now, so you can join through that. Streaming Zoom is difficult. Um, but I think that's more or less it. Uh, you should also be able to talk in the channel. Um, double check. Yeah, so feel free to do that. Awesome, that works. Um, all right, thank you all for coming. Oh, uh, and if you want to stay in touch, um, there's a lot of ways you can do that. Uh, if you go to unswsecurity.com slash join, there's a couple of links there. You can find us on Facebook, uh, on Slack. We have a Google Calendar, and all our events are there as well. Um, so that's more or less about it.